Okay. You see like a water thing over here, but it's not there anymore. Um, hi, my name is Chris, I'm an alcoholic. Um, and I've been sober since October 25th of 2007. And for that, I am really, really grateful. Um, thank you, Darren. Um, if you notice, he said, he's looking forward to hearing my story today, I think, or this time around. One of the uh, benefits or challenges of uh, being in recovery with your best friend is that you get to hear their story a lot. And so I'm sure he's praying for something new or different than what he's heard in the past. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. I want to thank John Politis um, for asking me to speak. And um, for teaching me about the water trick. Um, you'll see that come into play later, I'm sure. Um, so um, I don't know why uh, I've been so in my head about this, um, not just this morning, but really the last week or so. And um, you know what I know from all of you um, is that it's best to try to let all that go and just uh, say a prayer for God to have me say what he would have me say and hopefully um, have that be something that somebody needs to hear even if that's just me. So um, I've done that, and we'll, we'll hopefully trust that whatever comes out afterwards is what, what was meant to be. Um, so yeah, I, um, I'm an alcoholic, you know. Um, uh, I was taught by you all to um, explain a little bit what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like now. And um, what I can say is that um, what um, I was like, um, you know, I was born, um, I'm the youngest child of three um, or four, depending on how you count, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, and uh, you know, uh, my parents, both of them, um, today um, acknowledge that they're alcoholics, um, and miraculously, both of them today are sober. Um, and um, that wasn't always the case. So you know, the first um, you know five years or so of my childhood uh, was a little bit like Beaver Cleaver. My parents were married. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. Um, I don't have a lot of memories from that time, but what, the ones I do are pretty happy. I have this one particular memory of a family trip. My dad was from Massachusetts and we were living in Colorado. So we'd go back there for summers um, every couple of years to visit his family. And I just had this really specific memory of a time um, when we went back and uh, I think we rented a house on a lake and we were with my cousins. And it was just sort of this um, idyllic um, experience that you know you kind of hope your childhood to be like this was maybe a one week trip out of uh, you know 18 years but it it was a good memory and um and I had a um I had something happen on that trip that was both traumatic um, but also um, life changing really and I had kind of forgotten about it until um, recently when I was doing some spiritual reading and um, I don't know if it was the feast of St Francis or the writing just happened to be about St Francis and the um, the lessons, the spiritual lessons that animals can can teach us. And so this experience that I had when I was a kid, I was probably about two or three years old, and um, I was in the lake, and um, I wasn't a good swimmer, and I, somehow I got pulled under the water. And, um, you know, uh, my uncle, my big uncle Bill, who was had been a Marine, came running in and scooped me up out from underneath the water and carried me out back onto the shore. And when I got to the shore, you know, my mom asked me what happened. And I told her that the fish saved me. And she's like, what? And I said, the fish, there were a family of fish. There was a mom fish, there was a dad fish, and there were little kids fish, and they saved me. And, um, you know, and so of course, you know, they, you know, I guess maybe humored me or didn't, you know, they sort of told me I, maybe I made it up or, you know, that it, it didn't happen. It was my uncle who came in and swooped me up. It wasn't the fish. Um, but when I had this reading recently, um, what I knew in that moment, you know, so whether or not the fish saved me or whether or not I even really saw them, what I knew what I felt under that water when I was protected um, and safe, and whether that was my uncle's arms coming to get me or whether it was these fish that I thought I saw, in that moment I had this really clear sense that this little kid, this little boy, that I was safe and I was protected. And, um, and that memory came back to me um, Again, I've had it n numbers of times throughout my life, um, reflecting back on that, that moment, but I had forgotten about it for many, many years until I was doing this reading about St. Francis and um, animals and what they can teach us. And, uh, and so I really think that was my first you know, spiritual experience. You know, it was the first time that I, I recall feeling connected and feeling okay and feeling protected. And, um, and like most things, um, you know, it didn't last necessarily, you know, that idyllic childhood um, ended around age five when my uh, parents divorced and my mom remarried and she married another alcoholic. But unlike my dad, this one was violent. And um, 
and the next five years of my childhood were, you know, a lot like an after school special. Um, you know, there was just basically every type of abuse you can imagine, um, you know, happened under that household. And it was a really, really difficult time. Um, that at marriage ended um, on a, you know, a pretty um, aggressive, violent night um, with my stepfather and his interactions. And the police were involved, and it, it was kind of a thing. Um, but what happened after that, so that was probably when I was about 10 years old. And my first memory of, of drinking was when I was about 11. And it was at my grandparents' cabin up in the mountains. And we were camping. And um, we stole some of my grandfather's beer and some friends of ours, um, you know, we each passed around the beer and we each drank a little bit of it. And um, I remember lying in the tent and, you know, thinking the tent was spinning. And I don't know if the tent was spinning or not, but I thought that's what I should probably be feeling if I was drinking and I was drunk. So I was trying to, you know, I don't know if I was pretending or, um, again, whether or not I was having this real experience. But that was my first memory of alcohol. And uh, my older sister, stepsister at the time, um, found out about it and... Um, told us we had to tell our grandfather she was going to tell him um, for us. And I just remember, you know, I was like 11, 10, 11 years old, and my older brother and sister were just a couple years older than me. And, you know, going to my grandfather and, like, having to tell him that we stole his beer and that we drank it. And I'll never forget the look on his face. And he just, you know, was shaking his head. And he just looked so disappointed. And he just, you know, he just kept saying, you're so young, you're so young. And, um, and so that was my first experience with alcohol, you know, um, drinking, feeling like I was had the spins, whether I did or not, and then having to confess about it and disappoint someone I really loved and admired and respected. Um, and that was, I didn't really drink again until I was um, in high or in junior high. And um, I became really, really aware, I guess at a pretty young age, maybe in fourth grade, um, we switched schools and I became really aware of like social status status and you know there were the popular kids um, the, the, the new school that I went to there was this a group of guys and they were all on the Panthers uh, sports team so these are fourth grade how old are you in fourth grade like 10 11 and they're running around in these leather jackets like real leather jackets with peas on them and then they have the the football pin if they played football and the baseball pin if they played baseball and the basketball pin if, and I was just like, what, is, you know, what is this? And um, I just immediately remembering, you know, trying to get my head around what made somebody popular and why wasn't I popular and just feeling different and, you know, not really belonging. Um, and when I didn't have that leather jacket and I knew that I wasn't very coordinated or athletic and I probably wasn't going to get a leather jacket, you know, I, that was the first real deep memory I have of not being enough and trying to figure out how do I become enough so that other people will like me and other people will want me around. And um, I actually became friends with some of those guys on, um, on you know, on the Panthers. And um, in sixth grade, one of them was having a birthday party sleepover, and they were having kids from their, uh, other guys from their, um, their team, you know, come over and be a part of the party that didn't go to our school. And we were really all concerned because I was going to be the only guy there who didn't play any sports. And so we came up with this story that we're going to tell them I play hockey because none of them played hockey and they wouldn't know any better. And of course, the only position I could, I knew of was the goalie. So I was going to be the goalie on this hockey team. And, um, and we all went along with it, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's funny, but it's also like, it just reaffirmed this idea that the truth on my own wasn't enough. Right. And I had to make up a story to fit in and to belong and to get other people to like me. Um, so in fourth grade or um, 12th grade, gosh, I'm really nervous and I'm not sure why. Um, so I'm just going to take a second here. So in eighth grade, when I was 14, um, is when I really started drinking. And uh, it was for a pretty short period of time, for about six months. Um, my dad, who I told you is in recovery, he had gotten sober when I was 12 and um Part of his amends to us was to sit us down and explain to us what he knew about alcoholism and that you know one of the things he said was that they think it might be a um a hereditary disease and that we should be careful so i had that one drink when i was about 11 with that beer where i didn't have the idea already in my head that i might be an alcoholic every drink i've ever had after that the seed had been planted that i might be uh, an alcoholic so when i was 14 and started drinking with my friends on the weekends we would, you know, the girls would be babysitting and the boys would come over and we would steal out the liquor out of the liquor cabinets of the people's homes where they were babysitting. And, um, and I would, um, 
you know, drink and I would drink, I didn't like the taste of it. So I liked to drink vodka cause it would get me drunk fast. And that was my goal. And I would get, um, oftentimes sick and, um, you know, throw up and it was, it was just not pretty. And it was probably the second or third time that my dad who had been sober now for a few years was literally holding my head as I'm throwing up in the toilet that I had this idea that maybe I wasn't old enough or mature enough to handle my alcohol and I needed to stop. And so I did. And, um, and that was probably one of the worst things that could have happened because it gave me this false sense of control over my drinking that I didn't really have. And what I didn't know then, but what I know now is that I then substituted, um, alcohol with other things. Cause I still had that spiritual malady and I still wasn't enough and I still needed to f try to figure out a way to fill that hole. And what I filled it with was, um, you know, trying to be the best little boy in the world, you know, um, being super involved in school and, um, the community and, um, you know, holding a part-time job, um, and then trying to get good grades. And, and when that didn't all work, cause there just wasn't enough time, then I tried to fill that hole through um, shoplifting and then eventually um, through acting out um, sexually um, as a teenager, which was um, put myself in some pretty scary, dangerous situations as a pretty, pretty young guy. And um, what that did is it propelled me without to be able to get to college without having to drink. Um, but I was still trying to manage my feelings in these other ways that were not um, constructive or helpful. Um, I didn't drink through the entire freshman year of college. Um, and I, uh, I had joined the crew team um, at the college I went to that a rowing team, and I, and I was a walk-on, and um, went the whole freshman year without drinking. Um, I got a reputation um, with the girls of being way Catholic um, because I would only go so far with them. Um, <laughs> and uh, what they didn't know was that, you know, that acting out was not with girls, it was with boys. And so I was still conflicted about uh, my sexuality and, um, you know, trying to figure all that out. Um, but at the end of my freshman year, we were having our um, end of the year party for the, the crew team. And um, I, uh, I, I decided I, I, you know, I was 19 and I had been, you know, just finished a year of college. And I was old enough and mature enough now at this, this point to start drinking or trying to drink again. And so I did. And, you know, I woke up, um, I woke up the next morning, you know, lying next to somebody I didn't know, um, having blacked out the night before and completely more mortified because I was supposed to meet my parents, um, who had come, um, from the dri had driven from Colorado to pick me up from college. I was going to school in Washington, DC, and then to drive back home. And, um, you know, and that pattern um, of, of drinking, of blacking out, and of waking up next to somebody I didn't know is basically what it looked like, you know, and I could tell you endless, endless stories of, of what all that was about, um, but that's what it looked like. I was able to control it to a certain extent and that it happened maybe about once a month from that point on, so I was able to still do pretty well in school and maintain grades and all the rest of it um, and to somehow get myself into, um, into law school. And... Um, it was my last year of law school that I, um, I was coming out, I, a relationship that I had been in and we were living together, um, ended, um, and I was on my own really for the first time. And, uh, shortly thereafter, I, I discovered, uh, an outside substance, um, and, uh, crystal meth. And, um, once I discovered that and started doing that, then my addiction just took a totally different path and it went down a really, really dark, um, a dark course. Um, and what ended up happening was that, so that was in 1996. In 1997, um, by, the, by August 1997, I, I realized that I was um, in trouble and I needed to try to do something different. And I went to my first AA meeting. Um, at the time, I didn't think I really had a problem with alcohol. I thought the problem was um, the drugs. And so um, you know, going to AA to try to stop doing drugs um, really didn't make a lot of sense. And the sponsor that I asked to sponsor me at the time, I, you know, he picked up on that pretty quickly. And, um, you know, I think it, it was, um, intentional. He said, well, if you, if you don't think you have a problem with alcohol, then maybe you should go to NA and that maybe that's where you should try to get your recovery because if you don't want to stop drinking, you know, AA is really not the place for you. So I, I go to, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I was a little offended, but, um, but, but compliant, you know, I'm, I'm pretty compliant and I want to make people happy. You know, I'm a people pleaser. So I would go to NA and of course in their preamble, 
you know, they read whatever they read and it says that alcohol is a drug. And, you know, I felt like he got me, you know, like he, it was a trick. And, um, <laughs> and so, um, so that was, you know, in August of 1997, you know, as you know, my, my sober day is October of 2007. And so there were 10 years in between those two dates. And what happened was my life got um, incredibly small. Um, I moved from Washington to Boston and um, tried to do a geographic and a job change and thinking that all that was going to be what would fix me. And it didn't. Um, and instead, um, it got worse. And, um, you know, one of the ways that I tried to control and manage my using and my drinking was that I would try to get sober, you know, um, I'd run out of money or run out of time or run out of patients or with my friends and family. And I would, you know, go to detox or to a treatment facility. And, um, but I could, I couldn't get this deal. I couldn't, I couldn't keep it. Um, you know, I put together three months, two months, two weeks, six months. Um, but I kept coming back to the addiction. I couldn't understand why. And what I had, con had concluded was that, um, you know, the things that I did when I was out there were so horrific and um, so disqualifying as a human being that I, I never doubted the belief. I never had a doubt and a belief of God. You know, for that, that experience as a little kid, um, you know, when I was eight, nine, ten years old on Sunday mornings, I would um, watch the televangelists on, on the TV and um, Robert Schuler and the crystal cathedral um you know and i would i would i was motivated to try to you know um get some type of connection to god or religion that was going to make me okay um and so i never doubted a belief in god but what had happened was um but you know as my addiction kept spiraling more and more out of control i came to the belief that you know god had f forsaken me that the things that i had done i was no longer worthy of god's love or god's grace and um and I had a lot of evidence to support that because I, I would go to treatment, I would do whatever, what everyone would ask, and I couldn't, I couldn't stay sober. And, um, you know, looking back on it, you know, I was somewhat delusional. I thought I was doing everything that people were asking. You know, the very first psychiatrist I ever went to um, suggested 90 and 90 for me way back, way back when in the mid-90s. And, um, you know, I never did that, right? So I didn't do everything that was suggested, but in my mind, I had. And um, I couldn't get this deal. And so um, fast forward to, um, you know, the summer of 2007. And, you know, at this point, I am um, effectively homeless. I, um, I had all my stuff in a storage unit. I had a cell phone. I had a P.O. box and a gym membership. And so I was able to sort of manage, right? You know, I could use my cell phone to stay and connect with people. I got my mail at my P.O. box. I go to the gym when I needed a shower. And, um, and then I always found somebody that would let me um, sleep on their couch or if they didn't have an extra room. And so I was, I was couch surfing. Um, and that last summer, um, you know, part of how I was supporting myself is, um, you know, I, I was, uh, well, I was stealing from my best friend. And the way that happened was part of my attempts in trying to control and manage my using was I had given all of my money to this friend to manage for me. She was going to pay my bills and make sure that, you know, the, the cell phone stayed on and the health insurance got paid. Um, and as a result of that, her account was connected to my, um, uh, credit card. And I discovered I could call on the phone and pay off the balance on my credit card using the money from this account. And when all my money was gone, then I started using the money that she'd put in the account to pay off my credit, um, my credit cards. And, um, she discovered that and uh, gave me the option. She was either going to go to the police and tell them what I had done, or she was giving me the option to go to treatment um, one more time. And by this point, by the fall of 2007, I had been to 10 30-day or longer treatment facilities. Um, and some of those had been three-month facilities. Some of them had been you know, a 30-day that then transitioned into a, a you know, six-month sober living. You know, and I'd been to dozens of detoxes and, and shorter day programs. I've been to at least 10 30 day or longer treatment facilities. And so um, I wasn't sure um, that was really the solution, but there was something in me that didn't want to put her in the position of having to go to the police um, and, and tell them what I had done. 
you know, I was an addict who was active and I was a lawyer. And so in my mind, I thought, well, there's enough reasonable doubt here that I can <laughs> get away with this. Um, and that little voice in my head that said, you know, you don't want to do that to her. Um, you know, it was probably one of the most profound moments of my life because two things happened then. Um, I made the decision I wasn't going to do that to her and I was going to give treatment one more time or one more try. Um, but probably more importantly than that, the fact that little voice was even there was the bit of evidence that I needed that I hadn't completely killed all of the humanity in me with my addictions. Um, that there was still some sense of morality, some sense of right and wrong, and something I could hang literally my hat on in order to try to get going on this deal. And so um, I was really concerned about finding the right treatment center. Um, you know, at this point, like I had any options, but. Um, I had come across in my um, treatment travels, I guess, um, I had learned about this place in, in Texas, and um, when I looked at their website, they had on, the very, on, on their homepage of the website um, a version of the set-aside prayer, which is not in our literature, but um, it, there's places in the big book you could point to that sort of suggest the ideas behind the set-aside prayer, and essentially it's this notion that uh, you know, God, help me set aside everything I think I know about myself, um, you, this program, AA, the 12 Steps, the big book, uh, meetings, so I can have an open mind and a new experience. Um, help me see the truth about my alcoholism and my addictions. And when I saw that prayer on the website, it was the first time that this whole notion that I could have a different experience than what I had in the past with treatment and with recovery came into my consciousness. And, um, and so that was the place I decided to go. And, um, and that started me on this journey, um, that, uh, you know, it's been 14 years and, um, it's almost impossible for me to really get my head around that. You know, I was the guy who couldn't, who couldn't stay sober for more than a few weeks or maybe a couple months. Um, and, um, what I know from that is, um, you know, the steps are the, the path, um, you know, what I would, on my very, very first day at that treatment center, a, a client um, you know, met me and um, uh, pulled me aside and he said, can I show you um, Stickman? And I had no idea what Stickman was. And he asked me if I'd seen it and I said no. Um, and, but I said, yes, you can, you can show it to me. Um, he was a, a good looking guy, so that was helpful um, in my motivation. <laughs> um, whatever it takes, right, to get us in. Um, and, um, but I had a really significant um, experience in that here was another alcoholic doing what the book tells us to do, to sit down and share our experience, strength, and hope. And he was doing that, and he was doing it through um, the doctor's opinion at the beginning of the big book and explaining to me um, from his experience and from what the doctor had written about, you know, the nature of alcoholism and, and how, how the mind of the alcoholic is different and the body of an alcoholic is different. Um, and I kind of understood that, and I'd heard that before, but the aha moment for me was when he explained that how we get from being stopped or getting stopped to going back into the obsession of the mind and then, um, you know, the um, craving of the body where we put the drugs and, alcohol in our, and we, drugs and alcohol in our body and we just keep wanting more. And what he explained to me was that for whatever reason, um, trauma, psychology, human nature, um, but alcoholics, when we get stopped, life starts happening and we become restless, irritable, and discontented. And that can look like different things for different people. For me, it was just this physical anxiety where it felt like there was something inside my skin, like scratching to get out, um, that was so uncomfortable and so difficult that I would start then thinking about how I could get some relief. And it's that relief that gets us back into these, these lies that we tell ourselves, this time it's going to be different, this time I can control it, this time you know, I'm only going to do a little or I'm going to stop at 9 p.m. or whatever. And, and that's what gets the lies are then what gets us back into the obsession. And my experience is, is that once the obsession kicks in, my only relief from that is going to be to give into it and to, to do the thing that I'm obsessing about. And um, you know, he explained to me that that one of the definitions of obsession that I really, really like is um, it's this reoccurring thought that doesn't respond to reason. 
And he, ta- he encouraged me to really think about that, what that means. It's a reoccurring thought, so it's going to happen again and again and again, and it's not going to respond to reason. And so that it means that no matter what experience I try to throw at it and say, this is what's happened in the past, this is what's going to happen in the future if I do this, these are the people I'm going to hurt, it's not going to respond to any of that because that's what the obsession is. It's this thought. And the reoccurring thought is, I want to control and enjoy, or I need relief, I need relief, I need relief. And... Um, and the only way I knew how to get that relief was to pick up the addiction, the alcoholism, the drugs, whatever it was. And then I, you know, the phenomenon of craving because my body's different and the whole thing, the cycle would just keep going and going and going. And it was in that moment that I understood that, you know, I kept going back to my addictions, not because God had forsaken me or because I was inherently a bad person who didn't deserve recovery. It was because I was an addict or an alcoholic and I had no other way of dealing with my emotions or my feelings. And, um, and someone else had later explained to me that, you know, in the first step, it says that we're powerless over alcoholism, our lives have become unmanageable, that that unmanageability is not all of the consequences of my, my alcoholism. It's not all the crazy things that happened while I was out there doing the deal. It wasn't the HIV that I got or the money that I stole or the lies that I told or the people that I cheated on, um, that the unmanageability is my inability to manage my feelings. And that made sense to me because it was consistent with what um, this kid had told me about stick man and about the doctor's opinion and putting those two together, like really was life changing in terms of um, my understanding of, of what my addiction was and what it looked like and what I needed to do then to get well, because the treatment center that I went to um, and pr- pardon my French, but they, they called um, what they, so I, I found out later that he wasn't just like this, savant um, recovery kid um, that, you know, sick man was a big part of the curriculum at this treatment center. All the clients taught it and all the clients were, uh, had to, were encouraged very strongly to do it with new clients when they came in. And you got like these, not, not literally points, but you got like these brownie points with the staff when you did sick man with the newcomer. Um, I'd learn all that later, but on that day, um, what, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't like this savant who, um, I lost my train of thought. I got down that savant thing. Um, anyway, the point is, is that um, understanding that I wasn't inherently broken and that, you know, I, God, I hadn't gotten so far in my addictions that I was hopeless. You know, it gave me hope. Um, oh, this is, the, this is what I wanted to, about that, is that, so they explain the problem and the, um, the treatment center, they do this lecture on stick man and the doctor's opinion and they call it You Are Fucked 101. Um, <laughs> Because that cycle, that's what it is, right? Like you're in this cycle, you have these recurring thoughts, or the obsession of the mind, you can't get out of it unless you go back to the addictions and it just keeps going and going and going. Um, and so it's a really hopeless situation, except that we're given this program, right? And we're given the tools of recovery and we're given the steps as a way to learn how to be with ourselves and our feelings so that I don't have to keep going back, um, back to the... Um, the addictive patterns and addictive behaviors and the alcoholism, the drugs and, and all of the rest of it. And, um, and so, you know, I, um, I feel like I've been in step two. Um, so one of the treatment centers I went to the, there was a a woman director and she was this fabulous, um, former nurse and she, you know, wore these, it was, um, uh, the facility was in like the mountains, um, in, um, Connecticut. And it was just like, like, New England, like picturesque town. And it was like everything you would ever imagine for, you know, a Hallmark Christmas movie and, you know, set in New, New England. Um, and she wore these big flowing skirts and she wore cowboy boots and ascots. And, you know, she just was this fabulous woman. But she used to say that, um, that um, you know, we do the first step um, out there on the battlefield of addiction and the battlefield of alcoholism that that's where we learn the powerlessness. And, and certainly in those 10 years, I had that experience um, pretty well um, ingrained. And then I think where I got stuck was on, was on the second step. And I came to believe that, you know, I, n- I, never not, I never did not believe in a power greater than me or in a God. Um, what I didn't have was an access to that power in a way that was going to help me stay sober. And, um, and that was one of the things they explained to me. Um, you know, after they go through stick man, you know, he turned the page over and he draws a sun. He says, higher power. Um, and then um, another stick man and a, a line to the sun and saying, you know, the whole point of recovery is to get access to this power. It's not just the belief. 
it's the getting the access. And, and I feel like a lot of my recovery has been spent, um, on, on step two because, um, you know, I had this belief in God, but I didn't have an ability to access that when I, when I needed it, when I was in that moment of um, not being able to be with my feelings or the obsession starting to kick in. And I would always go back and I'd always go back and I'd always go back. And, um, and so, you know, I don't, I guess it had to been my first sponsor when we were reading the book together. Um, you know, and it, there's an asterisk, I think, um, in the, um, the second chapter, uh, there are two asterisks actually that suggest going back and looking at appendix two in the back of the book on a spiritual experience. And I'd never read those <laughs> before in those 10 years of trying to get sober. And, um, and so we read it and, um, what was, um, what was really sort of eye opening for me about that is the way that the appendix two explains the spiritual experience is that, um, you know, it's a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery. You know, that's all it is. You know, I had these really, in my mind, complex and interesting conception of God when I came into recovery, and I would be happy to share it with you if you asked. Um, but that, that, that theology or whatever you want to call it that I had around what God was or who God is um, was great, but it was all in my head. And, and it was even in my heart, but what it wasn't was in my ability to not be active in my addictions. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't connect with it in a way when I needed it. And so not that it was not worth something or it wasn't valuable, but it wasn't able to keep me sober. You know, my belief in God, my faith in God, it wasn't able to keep me sober. And what the appendix two explained to me is that I, I didn't have to get that complicated with it, you know? Um, and I had, for me at that point, it had to be more than just believing that this program worked for you. Um, cause I could, I saw that, you know, people that I, you know, during that 10 years, particularly when I was in Boston, you know, people would come in and, um, you know, they would five years later, they would be celebrating their five year anniversary and the marriages and the kids that happened in between, you know, and I'm picking up a 24 hour chip. And so I knew this deal could work for you, but I didn't think it could work for me. And so it wasn't enough just to see it working in other people's lives. I had to, um, figure out how it could work in my life. And what the appendix two explained for me was that I didn't have to get all complicated and distracted by, you know, what is God and who is God. What I had to understand is that recovery is a personality change sufficient to bring about, um, sobriety. And, um, and, um, I started going to Al-Anon maybe three, four years ago. So I'm not gonna make this an Al-Anon talk, but um, one of the things I learned there that was really helpful in this context was um, they call them the three A's, and it's, um, let's see if I can remember, it's um, awareness, acceptance, and action. And, um, and that's how I think about this personality change for me today, is that the steps give me the awareness of how I'm showing up in the world, particularly steps four um, and, uh, and 11. Um, and so that gives me the awareness of how I'm showing up. And then I can get frustrated by that. Um, you know, um, I had an experience, um, when I was probably six or seven years sober. I made a mistake at work and, um, my first instinct was to lie to my, our clients about it, to try to cover it up. Cause I didn't want to take responsibility. And, um, and I had to be talked out of that. Like it wasn't just the first thought it was like, my solution for a minute. And I had to be talked out of why this wasn't the best course of action. Excuse me. And, um, I was really disappointed in my, you know, I was six years sober. Right. And my first reaction on how to deal with a, an issue at work was to lie about it and to be dishonest. And I was really disappointed in myself because of that. Um, and then not shortly, you know, thereafter I, um, I, one of the gifts of recovery is I was able to save money and, and, and buy a condo. Um, one of the adult responsibilities of being a homeowner is you have to pay property taxes. And, um, you know, I didn't want to pay property taxes, you know, um, I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous for like seven years. I'm a proud Democrat who believes in government and, you know, I'm trying to figure out a way not to pay my taxes. And, um, and again, like the, the right answer became clear to me. Um, but I, I still didn't want to do it. Like I had to do work around doing the right thing, which was just to pay the taxes. And, um, and so that awareness, 
Like I don't have that without recovery. And like in the past, when stuff like that would happen, the conflict of that would be so great, I wouldn't be able to tolerate it and I would have to be active in my addictions. But recovery is giving me that awareness that look, this is how I'm showing up. And I don't like that about myself. You know, I don't want you to know about that. I'm ashamed of it. I'm embarrassed by it. Um, and so if I try to hide it, then, you know, it becomes this festering thing. One of my very first sponsors said to me that the only mistake you can make, well, there are two mistakes you can make in Alcoholics Anonymous. One is to keep a secret and the other is not to come back if you relapse. Um, and this idea of not having a secret was just really ingrained in me because that's the seed that gets planted that then festers and it becomes something then that I'm not able to tolerate. And if I'm not, and if I keep holding the secret and it keeps growing at some point, no matter how much spiritual connection I have, or no matter how much work I've done in this program or how much sobriety I have, that pain of that secret is going to be too great for me to handle on my own. And I'm going to start seeking outside things to try to make it better, to try to get rid of it. And eventually it's going to be, lead me back to drugs and alcohol. And so that's the, the awareness piece. And the acceptance is like, this is who I am, right? Like the things, one of the, the biggest things I had to come to grips with is that all of the horrible, horrible, and at times disgusting, disgusting things I did in my addiction, like I did them. That was me. You know, a housewife alcoholic, even a housewife meth addict does not do the things in her addiction that I did in my addiction. And I, I, need, to, I need to own that. You know, I need to lean into the fact that like this, I, I'm the person who did this. Like I did this. I had this dark side, I had the shadow, whatever you want to call it. But I showed up and I did these things. And the freedom in that is that I get to, as a seven step, you know, the prayer, I get to go to God with all of me, the good and the bad. And, um, and that's the acceptance piece in that, in that, you know, model or whatever from, from Al-Anon at the three A's and then, and then the action, right? And the action is like, I think the key because, you know, I can have the awareness about it. I can have the acceptance about it. But if I don't actually take the action to try to make it right or do something different, then I'm just stuck in that and that spiral and um and that's where meetings and all of you come in because and sponsorship and friendship and you know partners um you know i don't know what to do even even when i have the awareness and the acceptance i then don't know what to do to make it right and i'll get in my head you know these great ideas um on what i should do and they'll either be super dramatic you know like i'm gonna go and you know i'm gonna um, take responsibility for, um, you know, I made a mistake in law school and, um, you know, I, I had this idea, I'm just gonna go in, I'm gonna go to the law, go to the professor and explain to him what had happened. And, um, and you know, that's, what's going to make it right. And I talked to another lawyer about it and he's like, well, you can do that, but are you willing to accept the consequences of what that might, what, what that might mean for you and your degree and your law license and all of that? And is that really what needs to happen in this situation? Um, and so I was able to process that with him and my sponsor and come to a decision that was right for me and for that situation um, that was a little bit different than what I initially thought. Um, you know, I, I, I said that it, I had um, changed the way that I felt when I was in high school with shoplifting. And so, um, you know, part of my amends has been going back and paying, you know, for the things that I stole. And some of the stores are no longer there. Um, and I had this really, um, you know, uh, so the stores are no longer there. So in my mind, like the right action is, well, then, you know, well, too bad, right? Like they, they had their chance and they close, you know, they're no longer a business. So I'm, you know, oh, well, you know, and, uh, and my sponsor's like, no, that's not how that works. You know, like you still owe this debt, whether you owe, you can pay it back to them directly or not. We need to find other ways for you to, um, to make amends. This isn't your money. You're, you know, the things that you stole, they, they don't belong to you and you need to figure out a way to um, do you give them back if you can, or give the money back if you don't have the items anymore. And if you can't make the direct amends to the, the store or the person you stole from, then I, you know, he helps me, encourage me, and has guided me to make amends in other places where I'm able to do that. And like, I don't know how to do that without sponsorship and without going to meetings and hearing other people talk about their situations and how they handled them. Um, you know, uh, my um, alcoholism and addiction like my family's just completely riddled with it. And, um, you know, my, my brother, my older brother, um, you know, he died of this disease in 2010. And, uh, the day that I found out, like I was just coincidentally going to meet my sponsor for our regular meeting. And so I was able 
my sister called and told me what had happened and I went and met my sponsor and he got me grounded and then, you know, he stayed with me for as long as he could. And then he's like, okay, I, I need to, um, you know, I need to go. And, um, you know, I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to be alone. And, um, you know, I'd heard other people talk about when similar things had happened in their lives, you know, they went to a meeting and there was an eight o'clock meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, the Lambda group. And I was able to go and sit there and just, you know, just be, and um, be surrounded by recovery and not have to say anything. You know, I didn't, I didn't share. Um, I was chairing a meeting that Saturday and I didn't want to chair it. And I certainly didn't want to talk about my brother um, dying. Um, but some friends with more sobriety than me encouraged me to, to go ahead and, and share and um, to talk about this because it was important and to, you know, make myself vulnerable. Um, and so, you know, I did that and I got through that. Um, I got through that and I, I, I stayed sober through it. You know, I didn't have to drink um, because of it. And, um, and those are the types of actions that I just, I'm not um, able to do or figure out without, without all of you. Um, you know, COVID um, has been um, challenging for all of us. You know, I read a really beautiful description of, of um, family grief um, in relation to 9-11. Uh, the writer talked about when you have a family that's grieving, it's like everyone in the family is on the top of a mountain with broken bones, and they're trying to figure out how to get down the mountain. And, you know, they just have limited capacity to get themselves down the mountain, let alone, you know, to help each other. And, um, you know, some of them don't make it down the mountain. And, um, and I think that why that was so powerful when I read it was because I feel like with COVID, like culturally, like globally, we're, we're all going through this experience that's been difficult. And, you know, thank God at different points, some of us have more capacity than others. Um, but we're all going through this collective trauma, essentially. And, you know, trying to be supportive to each other and trying to be helpful for each other um, has been really, really, really challenging. Um, and, you know, I, um, I didn't had, didn't talk about it much, but I um, one of one of God has has graced me um, with unbelievable. I've I've learned unconditional love, and I've learned I've learned love from the friends and in, in my life. Um, and God has been unbelievably generous in putting people in my life who have given me that gift. And um, one of them was a friend of mine from Boston. Um, I was just thinking about it. He was, you know, 12 years sober when I met him. Um, so I have more sobriety now than, than he did when we first met. His name was Mitchell. And um, he, it's hard to describe. He was 27 years older. Um, he was never my sponsor, but he was my sponsor. He wasn't my father, but he was like a father. He wasn't my uncle, but he was like an uncle. He was um, not my best friend, but he was my best friend. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to, to even describe what that relationship was. Um, but he got cancer a year ago, a year and a half ago, and um, it was very sudden and it was really unexpected. It was in the height of COVID and he was in Boston and I was in Dallas and, um, you know, I didn't know what to do, you know, and I, I didn't know what to do, you know, I didn't know what to do. Um, and so I, I called Darren, who had experience with um, helping friends, um, a particularly close friend who was like a sister to him, um, not through cancer once or twice. She's had it multiple times. And, um, you know, we went for a walk, a socially distant walk during COVID. And I asked him, you know, what can I do for, for Mitchell? And he said, you know, just let him know that you're there. There's really nothing specific you can do. Um, I said, but I can't be there. And I don't know if I can go there. And, and what Darren encouraged me to do was to, he said, you know, you want to whatever you do it will be the right decision. But, you know, I'd encourage you to think about what you're going to regret if, if you don't try to get to Boston and if you don't have um, that time with him, whatever that may be like, cause I, he was in the hospital and I didn't even know if they'd let me see him. And so I, I took Darren's advice and I, you know, with my husband's help figured out how to get to Boston. And, um, you know, I was able to be there the last two weeks of his life and spend whatever time I could with him. He was in and out of the hospital during that two weeks. So there were times I got to, I got to see him. And then, um, you know, John, my husband flew out and, you know, we were able to be there with him, you know, when he took his last breath and that type of gift of presence, um, 
like, I can't do that. You know, I can't do that on my own. And I, I wouldn't have been in Boston if I hadn't talking, talked to Darren. And I wouldn't have talked to Darren if I hadn't heard other people in meetings, you know, share about being in similar situations and, and reaching out to people in the program who had sober experience and then doing that. Um, and so I guess where I want to end is just to say that, um, you know, I, I feel like right now um, I'm doing a lot of work, like I said, in step two. Um, I, I had a new experience with step five that kind of rocked my world a little bit. Um, you know, admitted to ourselves, admitted to God to ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Um, I always just understood that step to be doing, reading a fifth step after you've done a fourth step. And, um, you know, I, I read something recently that described the fifth step with that last clause, the exact nature of our wrongs. And um, really sort of encouraged, the writer was talking about how she's come to understand that to mean for her, you know, not kind of like with the consequences in the first step, it's not all of the stuff, you know, the, the exact nature of our wrongs isn't all of that stuff in our fourth step. Um, and it's not even all the character defects in our sixth step, but it's, it's what underlies all of that. You know, it's the lies I tell myself about myself. It's that I'm not good enough that I need to be something different um, to make you like me or to be okay. Um, that, you know, I'm a victim and I don't have the agency to, to, to do what I need to in my life. Like those are the natures of my wrongs and that my character defects are just the symptoms of that. You know, the righteous indignation, the, the judgment, the, the lying when I don't want people to know the truth about something I've done. Um, and it just really shifted for me how I think about the fifth step. Um, that was just a great reminder why I need to keep coming and why I need to keep showing up because, you know, no matter what I think I know, I, I don't. And I always am able to learn something new when I have an open mind to do that. And, um, and because of this program and because of the example that I see, you know, with so many people in this room, um, you know, I'm able to do that and I'm really grateful. Thank you.